Hey guys, and welcome to this message from Church on the Move, Broken Arrow. We're so glad that you joined us today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of three churches in Northeast Oklahoma. We've got incredible teaching and worship, not just for you, but for your kids and students as well. If you live near one of our locations, we would love for you and your family to come check it out and experience it for yourself. If you got any questions, you can drop a comment below or check out churchonthemove.com for more information. Let's jump into the message. Well, good morning. We're glad you're here. Everybody do okay in the rain? Everybody all right? Good. Glad you're here. If you're new to Church on the Move, maybe you haven't been with us very much. My name is Ethan, one of the pastors around here. And today we are wrapping up. It's the last in kind of a long series of teaching that we've been doing over the summer through the minor prophets of the Old Testament. And if you don't know much about those, those are the last 12 books of the Old Testament uh, in the in the you know kind of our Bible they're called the minor prophets in the Hebrew Bible they don't use that term they just call them the twelve and they're all grouped together in one section of writings but the last of these is the book of Malachi so if you have a Bible you can find uh, Malachi that's where we'll be today as we land this series uh, and if you need a Bible uh, our team will walk through the auditorium with a stack of Bibles I'd love for you to have one especially today we're going to do something a little different today uh, we're going to read these verses together and I want to give you a very personal moment with God's word and with this teaching. Here's what I mean. I want you to have time between you and God uh, to consider what he's saying today and what he's said through this whole series. And so I want you to have your own Bible. I will read these words, but they won't be up on any screens. And so if you have your phone, you prefer to do it that way, that's great. Or grab a Bible. It's the same Bible that I'll be reading out of. But let's have this in front of us. And then as we wrap this up, there is a big idea contained in the book of Malachi that is a great summary of everything God's been teaching his people through all 12 of these minor prophets. So as we study this, what we're going to do is we're going to land and we'll have a moment at the end to consider What's God been saying to you this summer? How has he been speaking to you? Because here's what we see through all of the minor prophets. The great reminder that we get is that God is speaking to every generation. These minor prophets are spread out over 400 years. They, the first uh, one is about 800 BC. The last one that we'll be reading today is Malachi, about 400 BC. That means there's 400 years. That's a long time. Lots of generations. World governments have risen and fallen. Things have changed. Battles have been fought. There's been heartache. There's been prosperity. There's been good times. There's been bad times. But in every season, God is speaking to his people exactly what they need to hear. And so so as we study this great summary from Malachi today, I want us to just stop at the end and have a chance to just contemplate between us and God. How am I moving forward in my relationship with God based on what he's been doing? And to do that, we'll take uh, communion together at the end. So if you're holding these, especially if you're a rule keeper, if you're an A-type personality, all of our administrators in the room are like, <clears throat> Pastor Ethan, did we forget something? Who didn't do their job? No, don't worry. We're going to take this together at the end, so hang on to that. And if you didn't get the elements of communion, uh, we'll get those to you at the end of service. And if you've never taken communion with us or maybe at a church before, I'll explain that uh, to you at the end. Um, but as we find the book of Malachi. It's one of the great Bible study hacks, by the way, is Malachi super easy to find. If you don't know where any of the other weird books are in the Old Testament, you can find Malachi really easy because it's the last one. Just find the books that you know, the people you have friends named, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Find those names. Just flip past one empty page right there in the middle, and you'll find Malachi right there. It is four chapters, and in these four short chapters, God is going to target one big issue. One issue that is at the heart of everything that Israel has been wrestling with for generations. And he's going to talk to his people about the issue of honor. Somebody say honor. Honor is something we're familiar with but sometimes fight against because honor is showing value to someone, elevating someone, and giving them a place of significance in our life based on our actions. Now, here's what I know about honor. We live in a culture that largely dismantles honor today, and that's because usually honor and authority go hand in hand. Where authority is abused, honor is often lost. And we live in a cultural moment where we've lost honor because authority has often been abused. 
Spiritual authority has been abused, and so we dishonor spiritual leaders. Political authority has been abused, so we dishonor political leaders. We dishonor uh, sometimes um, the values and the virtues of institutions, uh, schools and governments, uh, civic institutions like police and first responders, military. We dishonor them because honestly, oftentimes the power and the authority that they carry has been abused. And anywhere authority is abused, honor is usually misunderstood and often and lost. And here's what's happened with God's people. God's people have started to lose honor because uh, two main reasons. Uh, The first is that authority has been mistreated. The first group of people that God talks to in Malachi are the priests. The priests have stopped operating in their spiritual office in a way that honors God. And because they've stopped doing that, people are suffering. And so God talks to the priests about returning to a relationship of right honor with God and uh, and actions and behavior that flow out of that honor to God. But then God talks to his people as well. And he said, "You're, you're also suffering from a different source of lost honor. We don't just lose honor because authority is abused. Sometimes we lose honor because life gets good. In particular with God, here's what often happens. And we get the gift of seeing God's people follow him for generations when we read the Bible. And we get to zoom out and we get to see, uh, I don't know if you have a friend like this, they keep getting themselves in trouble. So you can sit outside of their life and you can go, hey, bud, listen, sister, I could tell you what you're doing wrong and how you're hurting yourself because I sit like a lifeguard outside of your life and I can see everything you're doing and how you're hurting yourself. And if you just listen to me, I could help you. This is the view that we get of God. God's people as we read scripture. We see them go through these cycles over and over again. And here's what happens. They get themselves in trouble because they forget God and they start living for themselves. And I think we can all relate to that. There are always times where I catch the disease of me. I get stuck in the quicksand of selfishness and I want to live my life my way. And anytime I separate myself from God's way of living, I find pain. I I, I get into heartache and regret. And when I do, what happens? I get desperate for God again, and I go, hey, God, I am stuck. I'm hurting. Will you help me? And God, in his grace, jumps in over and again to help his people. And when he rescues his people and puts their feet back on solid ground and saves them, they praise God, and they say, thanks, God. And then generations go by, and they live in God's goodness, and they begin to take God for granted, and God becomes ordinary to them. And the goodness of God from past years or past generations becomes commonplace or a story that we tell of what God did once upon a time and we forget that it's God that got us where we are today. And I think what happens with Israel can happen with us, especially in the moment we live. Now, I know that for many of us, we might say, Pastor Ethan, I'm not living in a good place right now. Life is hard and and I, and I, I can definitely sympathize with that. But I would also say that by and large, we live in a really good moment in human history. We live in a pretty good city, in a pretty good state, in a pretty great country in an era where we are reaping the benefits of generations that have fought both physical and spiritual battles on our behalf, and in a lot of ways we're reaping good harvests because of wise decisions that other people have made. And Israel in Malachi is in a very similar situation. If you remember how we're studying through these chronologically, the history, here's what's happened. Israel was one country living under one king, and then they were two after a civil war. And both of what we call the north and the south kingdom of Israel eventually got captured by foreign governments. Their people were taken into exile and they lived in a foreign land, but God brought them home, returned them out of exile. They lived back in their homeland, the place of God's promise, and they rebuilt cities. They planted new farms. They started to live in a new season of prosperity and God's goodness. And Malachi is written to a group of people that are back in Israel. Their parents and grandparents fought the battles to survive in a foreign country, to return to God's land, to build a new life and restore the flourishing uh, community that God had for them. And they're living in the goodness. They're reaping the harvest of what their grandparents and their parents have done. And in this season, God says, you've lost your honor for me. You're starting to treat me as commonplace. And God says in Malachi chapter one, verse 14, but yet I am the king of the earth, but they've stopped treating God like that. And so God's going to unpack for them how to recapture both a heart of honor 
and a lifestyle of honor that will lead them to the flourishing life that he wants for them. And so this is how Malachi starts. Malachi chapter one and verse one. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Malachi, the, the, the word or the name literally means messenger. Many Bible scholars think that This may not be his literal name. God may have intentionally left his name out and they just call him messenger. We don't read about Malachi anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, And it may be that God is trying to say, don't worry about who's giving you the message. I just want you to hear the message. This is literally like, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what God says, okay? In fact, Malachi never talks during all of this, these four chapters. This is just God talking and Malachi's writing it down and giving it to God's people. So what does God say? Well, verse two, I have loved you, says the Lord. Wow, great place to start. I like how this is, this is going. I think I might really like the book of Malachi. And here's where God starts the whole thing. Is he says, I don't want you to forget that everything I'm about to tell you is coming out of my love for you, especially for you and I that sit here on the other side of the cross. Jesus has died for our sins. He's been raised to new life so we can walk in the fullness and newness of life that God wants for us. Our sins forgiven and our future secured. We sit under the grace of God, which means that whatever God is going to tell us about honor is not to earn his love. Really important principle to base everything on, okay? Nothing God tells you to do is because God is trying to get you to behave right so he can love you more. God loves you as much as he will ever love you right now. The grace of Jesus shouts to us from Calvary, I love you enough to send my son for you. He died for your sins so that you can be forgiven. You don't have to live under guilt and condemnation. You no longer have to try to do a dance to measure up to God. And there are two ditches with how you hear the commands of God through scripture. One ditch is legalism. Do you know what this means? Legalism means I have to dot every I and cross every T and live a religious lifestyle so God will like me more. And if I don't do everything just right every single day, I live under this cloud of judgment that says, I don't think God is going to be happy with me. I don't think God is going to do good things for me because I'm not doing everything I'm supposed to do. And grace, the sacrifice of Jesus tells us that legalism and religion died when Jesus died on the cross. You no longer have to live under that cloud of condemnation, trying to measure up and do the dance for God to please him so he'll pay attention to you and love you. He loves loves you, period. Wow. But here's the problem. When we pull the car out of the ditch of legalism, if we're not careful, we steer into the ditch on the other side of the road. And it's a big word. Okay, you ready? Here's your theological word for the day. The ditch on the other side of the road is what we call antinomianism. Big word. It's made up of two Greek root words. Anti, we know what that means, right? Against nomos, which means law or rules, regulations, against regulations. If we steer into that ditch, here's the, here's the error of antinomianism that goes all the way to the other side of the road, which is, hey, here's how I think it works. If God loves forgiving sins, what a great relationship because I love committing sins. That's a pretty good arrangement. Let's do that. And so what we do is we go, well, and the New Testament, Paul unpacks it this way. He says, we begin to presume on the grace of God. In other words, what does it matter how I live? Because God's just going to take care of me. And if we're not careful, what we end up doing is we end up treating God as just another thing in our life, a person that doesn't really care how we live so we can do whatever we want because he'll always be there whenever we need him. And this is, what is, this is the ditch that Israel has fallen into because the very next words, and here's what we find, seven times in Malachi, God has an argument or a dispute with his people. But here's what I love. The people never actually talk. God says, I already know what's in your heart. Let me tell you what you're thinking. And so God says what he's thinking, and then he tells them what they're thinking. And I love this. He says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved me? Whoa, 
How have I loved you? Have you ever experienced this? Hopefully not in your own home, but maybe with a child in someone else's home. God forbid it would be your house. But they kind of go, well, mom and dad are gonna be there you know, whenever I need them. And then when mom and dad go like, I've taken care of you and they want something else from you. You go, how, what have you done to take care of me? And you go, look around you like you're, you're breathing air because I made you, <laughs> right? You, there's electricity and you can touch the wall and the temperature and the room changes and there's food in the kitchen because I love you. How have I loved you? And this is what Israel is, they're turning into a spoiled child and God says, I love you. And they go, what do you, how? Whoa, these are literally people whose feet are planted in the dust of God's promise keeping character. They're living in the place that God promised to Abraham. And for generations, their ancestors had to fight literal battles and spiritual battles just to build a country under spiritual attack from every enemy on every side. And God provided and God protected them. God gave them his promise. And out of this country, eventually God will keep his saving promise to all of humanity. How have I loved you? And God says, let me remind you how much I've loved you. And he points to an interesting place. I think this is fascinating. The very next verse, he says something, and it feels like God goes off track. Has this ever happened for you? You're talking to God about something, and he goes somewhere else? This is what he says. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. What does that have to do with anything? Well, here's what he does. He rewinds Israel's history back to two brothers, Jacob and Esau. And what he says is he says, these two brothers grew up in the same family, with the same possibility for the future of their life. Jacob and Esau were the grandsons of Abraham. Abraham was the man that God first made a covenant with. He called, them, called Abraham out of his country, and he says, out of your commitment to me, you make a covenant with me, I'm gonna build a family that will become a nation that eventually will become my people through the Messiah. You and I sit here because of what the covenant God made with Abraham. The covenant that God made with Abraham passes through the birthright, do you know this word? The inheritance to the oldest son, from Abraham to the son of promise, Isaac, yes? And from Isaac, it's supposed to go to Esau. It was supposed to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But if you've ever heard those generations, people talk about in church, they say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Ah, in Genesis 25, we find an interesting story where Esau, the older brother, the one who's supposed to get the birthright, is hunting in the field, and he comes home, and he's hungry. His little brother is making chili, and he says, hey, if you give me chili, I'll give you my birthright. Now, on the outside, that sounds like to us, an American you know, uh, audience, you go, your dad has a trust fund and a bunch of money and a bunch of inheritance. You're going to give your brother the inheritance for chili? That makes no sense. But the inheritance or the birthright doesn't just come with money, it comes with responsibility. You become the head or the one who's responsible for the whole family. Esau, scripture says, despised his birthright. What it means is I don't want the responsibility. Take the money because I don't want any of the responsibility or any of the, 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 the flow from God's authority. I don't want to live in any of that whole thing that he promised Abraham and that Isaac was taught. I don't want any of that. You take that, just give me what I want right now. I'll take care of myself. Whoa, and God says, because Esau does this, he separates himself from honoring me. I'm not gonna do things God's way, I'm gonna go do it on my own, and I'm gonna let you, Jacob, take this God thing. And when Jacob takes it, God says this in the very next verse. He says, aren't Jacob and Esau brothers? Yet, what's the very next verse? Yet, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I loved hated. Whoa. Doesn't that sound weird to hear God say he hates anybody, especially when it comes just a few words after he says, I love you. But God is saying, compared to Jacob, I have hated Esau compared to how much I've loved Jacob. Why? Because Esau disconnected himself from his relationship with me and chose to go do it on his own. But Jacob chose to honor me and live into, his, live into my plan for how I was going to bless the family. When that happens, he says, Esau now has to fend for himself, but you, Jacob, live under my protection and my blessing because you're honoring me. In the very next verse, he describes this. He says, I have laid waste, verse three, to his hill country, and I've left his heritage. 
Now his inheritance, his birthright, I've left that to the jackals of the desert. God is saying now Esau has to fight his own battles. He wants to live on his own. What he's going to find is that he has cut his relationship with me, which is the lifeline of all the blessing that I wanted to bring into his life. God tells Israel, when they, when they look at him and they go, how have you loved us? He says, you are literally living in the middle of the proof that honor works. I have elevated you above Esau. I've elevated you. I've put you in a place of honor. I'm bringing blessing into your life. I'm going to take care of you because I value you. Out of my character is going to flow all of this blessing, and you're going to find out that when God honors me, life flows. And so God says, if this is how life flows, then wouldn't it make sense that you should honor me to stay in the flow of that life? Not to earn my love, but because I've loved you, you should honor me. In fact, in the very next few verses, if you jump down to verse six, God says this, a son honors his father and a servant honors his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? He says, you've stopped honoring me as the one who's brought all of this blessing into your life. And here's what God goes on to do. He goes on to tell his people that there are real ways that honor has to flow from your heart into your life. Honor always has two components. Both of these components have to be together. They've got to be twisted together like two live wires in order for the power to flow. First, a heart of honor that says, I understand first who God is and then who the people God's placed around me are, and I value them. But it's not enough for honor just to sit in your heart as a feeling. Honor, to be real honor, has to be expressed. Honor has to be shown. So with your words and with your actions, God's going to say, I want your honor to flow first to me and then to the people around, around you. And he's gonna give them three real world ways that they are being hurt because they've lost honor. He says there's things breaking apart all around you because you've stopped honoring me and you've stopped honoring others. Here's a biblical principle. Where you lose honor for God, you eventually will lose honor for others. Israel has stopped honoring God, and God says there's some places that are suffering. He's going to point to three places. The first is, he says, in the area of justice in your community. There are people in your community who are the least, and when honor is lost, the least get lost as well. The widow, the orphan, the poor, the foreigner, the one who's exiled, they're getting pushed aside. Why? Because when you lose honor, what happens is, you lose any reason to value people that can't pay you back. So a community gets built on sort of quid pro quo, a, a buy and sell economy. If you can do something for me, then I'll treat you with respect. But if you can't do anything for me, why would I respect you? When you lose godly honor, a community begins to fall apart because a widow can't pay you back. An orphan can't pay you back. The, the foreigner, the sojourner, the least, they can't pay you back. So only the influential, only the power, powerful, they get honored because they can do something for me. Only if you have money will I take care of you or show you respect. Why? Because I want something from you. And God's says that's not godly honor. As Christians in a community of faith, we honor people because they're made in the image of God, not because they can pay us back. That's why historically Christians have always raised the level of everybody in a community. Why? Because we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, showing the love that he's shown to us, to others, even the least, even the ones that can't pay us back. And I would argue, especially them, because that's my relationship with God. I couldn't do anything for him, but yet he gave me everything. And God says that's falling apart in your community. And then he says, it's not just your community that's falling apart, it's your homes. And he points to a surprising place in chapter two. He says, you've lost honor in your marriage. And he's not just talking about you and your spouse. He's talking about all of the, the closest relationships you have. He said, they're falling apart. And in particular, he says something really powerful. In chapter two, he says, you come to me, you come to the altar, you make a sacrifice, and you cry, literally, you cover my altar with tears because you're, you're crying out, you're desperate for me to show up in your life and to bless you and to take care of you. And he says, I won't. Whoa, why? Why, I'm, 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 I'm praying, I'm crying out, God help me, but yet God is not hearing or honoring their prayer or their sacrifice. Why? God says, because you're, you've dishonored your spouse. He says, where you don't honor the relationships I've put in your life, you can't expect me to step in and fix what is, what is broken by your choices. I can't just step in and undo 
all of the things that your foolishness or your bad decisions have led you to. So you can't expect God to just jump in like a, you know, some kind of parachute that you wear and you jump off a building in foolishness and go, oh shoot, I didn't realize that this was gonna destroy everything. God saved me. Now will God step, step in and save you with mercy and grace? Yes, but here's the picture that God gives. He says, you can't keep taking one step off the starting line, go, I'm gonna follow God, and then I'm gonna make foolish choices. And I'm gonna follow God, and I'm gonna make foolish choices. Here's what you're doing. You're just taking one step forward and one step back, one step forward and one step back. And he goes, I have more for you. I've got more life for you. It's not about my grace and whether or not I'm gonna forgive you. It's about whether or not you can run into the fullness of life I have for you. He says, so I want you to take the honor that you have for me and start expressing it in the closest relationships that you have. And then he turns to the third example of real world honor. And he says, if you're gonna honor me, I also want you to honor me with your money. Wow, and this is the most quoted and most famous part of Malachi. In fact, those of you that have been in church for a long time, if you hear that we're talking about Malachi in church, you probably go, oh, that's the section that talks about, anybody? Yeah, money, specifically there's a T word in there, but you need a T word? Tithing, yeah. And especially if you don't like that, you're like, don't go there. Like, why would you talk about that? Here's what God says. He says, you've robbed me. Yes, God is having this imaginary argument. You've robbed me. People say, how have we robbed you? You've stopped tithing. Interesting. And when we hear that, we kind of go, oh, here we go. This is, it's the preacher's favorite verse, right? We're gonna talk about money in church. Here's, but here's what, it, just keep this in mind. Hear this through the lens of everything God is talking about. It's just one example of a whole bunch of examples God is giving about how you disconnect from his life when you stop honoring him and putting him first in any area. And the thing that God goes out of his way over and over to, again to tell us is the reason I'm asking you to trust me and put me first is not because I want something from you. You need to know this about God. You cannot enhance or diminish God. You can't make God better or make God have a bad day. You can't do it. You can't scratch or dent God's character. If every person on planet earth shook their fist at heaven today and decided to go live a life of sin and reject God, it would not change God one single bit. It would not scratch his glory. It would not change his sovereignty. It would not change his overall power or plan for humanity or planet earth. God is God. He is perfect. He does not need anything from me. God does not need any gift that I could give him. And he especially doesn't need my money. But God knows that my money is connected to every area of my life. And wherever I disconnect honor to God, I disconnect the life of God. And so what God wants me to know is he says, I want you to begin to honor me in all of these areas. And I want to read to you what God says happens when we honor him. I want to read the section about tithing, not because I want to harp on money, but because I want you to see the heart of God. You follow me? So read these verses with me. Chapter three and verse 10, one example of three big ones, your community, your home, and your money. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Ah, God, we get the first clue of why God wants us to honor him with our money. Anytime you honor God, everybody wins. You gotta know that. So God says, honor me with your money. Why? Because when you honor me with your money, you make ministry possible. You, giving to a church, giving to a ministry should never be about making the ministry richer. Yes, you know that. It's not about making pastors wealthy or making sure, you know, churches have gold-plated walls. You give, you don't, and I say it often about Church on the Move, you don't give to the church, you give through the church. The church is the avenue of a whole bunch of people getting together to change the world. That's what we're doing. So we're giving food to God, right? They're like, we're supposed to be a buffet for people that are hurting and, and, and lost to come eat at. So we give to make that possible. That's the first reason that God says to do it. But then he says, this is what's gonna happen when you do this. If you honor me in this area, but keep in mind, this is what happens when we honor God everywhere. I want you to put me to the test, specifically with your money. Here's why. Your money touches every part of your life and God knows that you're gonna have a hard time with this one. God knows. You can't see me. You don't know when you choose to honor me with your money, you don't know how it's gonna work out. So test me in it. Say, God, I'm trusting you. If this is true, you gotta come through. And this is the one place in scripture he says to do this. It's powerful. Here's why. God says, I want you to trust me with your money because money is supposed to be the main source of my blessing into your life. And you have the choice, Jacob or Esau, under my, under my authority and honoring me or out on your own. 
So I want you to choose to honor me so I can bless your life. That's exactly what he says. Test me in this. If I will not do what? What am I going to do when you honor me? I'm going to open the stinking windows of heaven. I'm going to pour out a blessing on you until he says, there's no more need. I will rebuke the devourer. Not only do I want to bless you, I want to hold off all the things that try to take away the blessing that I've already given you so that there, it's not going to destroy the things you're growing. The vine and your field will not fail to bear fruit. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. God wants your life to be full of blessing and delight. He wants your community, the people around you, to be full of delight and goodness because you're operating in wisdom because you've honored God. He wants your home to be marked with that. So anywhere you honor God, life grows. This is the picture that you're supposed to get. And so the question then is, why does God care so much about honor? Does God just have a massive ego? Does God just set it up this way to say, hey, if you'll worship me, if you'll honor me, I'll make sure that you get blessed because God's got a big ego and he's got his elbows out and it's got to be all eyes on him, the spotlight on him. No, here's what God knows. Anywhere you separate your life from the life giver, life dies. Honor is the way I realign my life with the one who created it so that it works the way he made it. Wow. Everywhere I make the decision, God, I'm going to honor you with my words. I'm going to honor you with my attitudes. I'm going to honor you with my relationships. I'm going to honor you with my money. We're lining those things up under his ways. And we're saying, God, even though I don't see how exactly it's going to work, I'm going to trust your ways over my preference, believing that it leads to a life I could never manufacture on my own. Here's the way honor works, and you've experienced this. Honor is the currency of unity. The power of God always flows through the unity of God's people. This is what we see in the book of Acts, especially for us as Christians. We believe that God's given us the gift of grace through Jesus and the Holy Spirit to fill us and unite us. Anywhere God's people are unified, they're together in a family, in a marriage, in a church, in a business, anywhere God's people get together and link arms and go, we're going to do this together, honoring God, the life of God and the power of God flows. You'll hear me say it often. When you have the unity of the book of Acts, you have the power of the book of Acts. They were all together in one place, one accord, sharing their life together, meeting the needs of each other. And when they're all in unity, the power of God can flow. The currency of unity, the way you build unity first between you and God and then you and the people you care about is honor. Honor is the currency, like money, that gets exchanged between relationships. When I honor you and you honor me, we can have a strong relationship. Wherever honor grows, relationships grow. Wherever honor shrinks, relationships break apart. It's as though there are a thousand tiny little strings holding together relationships. And you've experienced this. They don't always rip at once with one thing. Sometimes there's a big enough thing that can rip a relationship apart. But most often it's little expressions of honor. One at a time, words and attitudes and behaviors. When someone dishonors you, your relationship with them begins to break apart. I bet you've experienced this. There's probably been somebody in your life that dishonored you. And when they did, through either their words or their actions, you saw what was really going on in their heart toward you, and it pushed you away from them, yes? Maybe you were dating someone, you're dating a girl, and when it's just you and her, she's kind to you, and she considers you, and she thinks about you, but then when her friends show up, it's as though you don't exist anymore. Have you experienced this? And when she dishonors you, you do you go, man, what a sweetheart. I sure love her. She's so great. No, what do you start to think? She might not really like me after all, as much as I thought she did. Why? Because her lack of honor or her dishonor starts to show you her heart. In the same way, you've experienced someone honoring you, sometimes when it wasn't easy for them to do, sometimes maybe when it cost them something. And because they went out of their way, maybe in public, to elevate you, to value you, to brag on you, to put their arm around you and say, hey, she's with me, he's with me, I love them, I'm proud of them, look at them. When they honor you, what does it make you do? It makes you go, man, I'll go to battle with you. Like, what a friend, what a, what a person, what a, what a great ally to have in your life. Where honor grows, relationships are strengthened. And so what God knows 
is that all of that honor doesn't flow just because you like people a lot, because honestly, most of the time, honor costs you something. Honor is a spiritual attitude that flows from a regenerated heart best. You can express honor without God. We see, we see expressions of honor all the time. However, honor in a Christian community is different because we believe that God has honored us and so I'm gonna step into a relationship of honor with God. And as an act of faith, I'm gonna to begin to honor things and people the way that God has set it up. And the reason that honor works as currency is because honor either attracts or repels us. It either binds us together stronger or it pushes us away. It's like a magnet that you can turn either way. And a magnet turned the right way will shook, click people together. Honor turned the wrong way, we'll chase, no matter how good our intentions, no matter how much we want a relationship, if we dishonor somebody, it's like a magnet constantly pushing them away. There's an amazing story of how this works in Genesis chapter eight. Uh, it's a story of when Noah uh, steps off of the ark. You know the story, yes, Noah uh, and his family are saved from the flood. God resets creation and on this ark, God saves Noah and his wife and their uh, three sons and daughters-in-law. Only eight people on planet Earth remain and the ark finally settles on dry ground and the door opens and Noah walks out into the disaster zone that is now planet Earth. And when he walks into the mud that's left behind after this destruction, he kneels down in the dirt and the mud and he gathers rocks together and he builds an altar. And on this altar, he sacrifices to God a sacrifice and he honors God. The first action of Noah out of the ark into the salvation that God provided was to honor God. And there's a fascinating verse at the end of chapter eight in Genesis and it says, God smelled the sacrifice that Noah made to him. God smelled Noah's honor. And I love this picture because what God is doing is God is not absent, God is not distracted, and Noah over here is doing his own thing, and then Noah starts a barbecue, and God goes, well, what's that over there? And he, and he gets close. God, there's only eight people on planet Earth. God is very aware of what's happening with Noah, but yet it is when Noah honors God that this rises to God as a smell, and God steps in. So the question for me then is, what happens when God smells honor? What happens? What's the result? Well, honor works on your life the same way that odor works physically. Honor works spiritually the way odor works physically. You know how odor works, yes? Odor uh, either attracts you to somebody or pushes you away from somebody, right? Like, you, you, you know how this works. This is why when we're going on a date, we put on cologne, right? Why? Because you want to get close. And smell, what you smell like will draw you in or push you away. This is why Sarah and I, raising two teenage sons, we always used to joke, if you wanna have a conversation with the boys, bake cookies, right? They're, they're gonna smell it, and they're gonna come in the room, and you can have a, con why? Good odors draw us in. You, you probably can't see it right now, but I, I have beard oil in my, ear, in my beard. Do you know why? Because I want Sarah to get all up in this thing. That's why, that's why, that's why it smells. It smells, like, it smells like hickory in America, everybody. It's just like, it's like why? but, but yeah, every day when I come home from my run, I make the same joke. I come in all sweaty and gross and I go to give Sarah, come here, give me a hug. And she's like, not a chance, hippo, go take a shower. Why? Because you stink, right? Odors draw you in, they repel you away. Honor works like odor. Honor is not your heart. Odor, aroma, is not food. Aroma is not the thing. Aroma, what something smells like, is how you know what that thing is made of. How do, you, how do you know if milk is rotten or fresh? Smell it. Why? Because you can take a big whiff and you can know what's inside. Honor expressed or dishonor expressed reveals your heart. When Noah makes this sacrifice to God and this aroma rises to God, what Noah is doing is saying the very first thing that I'm doing after God's saving grace is I'm honoring him as the one who saved me. And it would have been very easy for Noah to fall into the temptation that Israel is falling into in Malachi and the thing that you and I face, which is what did God have to do with this? God didn't build the ark. I did. Where was God when I was swinging the hammer? 
Where was God when my hands were bloody and calloused? Where was God in the middle in the middle of all of the hundreds of years of getting splinters and cutting down trees? Where was God when my sons didn't want to help me anymore and I had to argue with them and, and convince them to keep helping me? Where was God every time people made fun of me of making this ark? Where was God when the rain came and I had to survive on this boat? Where was God? I did this. God didn't do this. God didn't swing a hammer or chop down a tree. I did. But yet no one knows something. I may have swung the hammer, but God saved me. And so he walks off the ark, and the first thing he does is he says, God, you, you did this. Thank you for saving me. And here's what happens. The end of chapter 8 says God smells this, and it gets his attention. And then the very next verse in chapter 9 says, and God blessed Noah and his sons. Everywhere God smells honor, God commands a blessing. This is why God says, when you honor me with your money, there's an odor, there's an odor, there's a, a smell coming off of your life. I'm honoring God, I'm putting God first. When God smells, smells honor in your home, he commands a blessing on your home. When God smells honor in a community, we're taking care of people, we're looking out for each other. We're, 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 not, just, we're not just being kind, you know this, right? Honor is not just kindness, honor is the expression of my heart. And if honor goes unexpressed, how would anybody in your life ever know you honor him? How would God ever know? Although he knows your heart, he waits for your actions. So here's the question. If honor is this precursor to God's blessing because it lines me up where I'm supposed to be and God can go, God can point at me and go, ah, there's a family honoring me right there. Look at him, look at him, look at him. There's a, there's, there, there's a, there's a, there's a student honoring me right over here. Look, 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 look at that. Look at that. There's kids honoring me right over here. Then God says, that's a person that is... Lined, not Esau, Jacob, lined their life where it's supposed to be. And now the blessing can flow because honor is this connection through relationship to the God who made you where honor flows and things grow. And so here's the question for us. How am I honoring God with my life right now? Especially as we land this plane, we see hundreds of years of this cycle. God's saying, get back in a right relationship. Honor me, put me first, and watch life get unleashed. But when you don't put me first, it's going to be a struggle. So if we get the gift of seeing that, shouldn't we stop for just a second, pause our life, and just go, okay, okay, okay. Am I honoring God? Here's kind of your homework for this week. Starting today, if you would, reach down, grab those elements of communion. We're going to take those in just a moment. Starting today and then this week, in your time with God, as you're contemplating this, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to ask yourself this question. Great little test. If God was to show up in my life in a body, a, a literal, a, a physicality, God, a person, was to walk into my house, God was going to show up, what, what would it change? How would I feel? Would I be very aware that my life is honoring him and would I be so glad he's there? Or would I be very aware that there's some places and some things I'm doing that I wouldn't want him to be around? How would it change if you were to tell your family, hey, God's coming for breakfast. Don't do the thing we normally do. Like, let's not be our normal family. God's here, so we gotta be somebody different. Or would you be like, no, we honor God. It's obvious in our words, in our behavior, how we interact with each other. It's obvious we honor God. How, what would it change with your friends? Hey, God's coming to brunch with us. Can we like not talk about this? Can we just like, er, not gossip and you know, like what would it change? God's gonna play that round of golf with us. Let's not, right? Bill, don't, okay, God's here. Hey, what, what would it change? We honoring God, are we honoring God, are we honoring God? And here's the, the thing that it kind of leads me to is to go, okay, how do I, how, like, sometimes it can feel kind of complicated because it feels like there's a lot of areas of my life I should honor God. Can I just simplify it all down? Can I show you how simple honor is to God? All through Malachi, God's talking to people that aren't honoring him, yes? But then there's this one little section of verses in Malachi chapter three, verse 16, where people are honoring God. There's not many of them, but there are some people honoring God. And this is what it says about the people who are honoring God. And I believe this is us. I don't think you'd be here this morning if this wasn't what you want for your life. Malachi chapter three says this in verse 16. Then those who feared and honored the Lord spoke to one another. Interesting sentence. There's a, there's a heart of honor toward God, but it's, it's shown in their words toward each other. 
they're talking to each other about God and they're encouraging each other. It's obvious those people are honoring me and they're connecting the dots between their relationships. They're talking to each other about me. Do you know what the New Testament instruction about honor is? Romans chapter 12 says this, very simple, outdo one another in showing honor. That means in a Christian community, honor is no longer an economic idea. Uh, in other words, well, yeah, if my wife honors me, I'll honor her. No, you're supposed to outdo her in honor. Wow, I'm supposed to outdo you in honor. doesn't matter how much you honor me, I'm supposed to honor you more. Wow. God says they, they're, they're together around this. They're talking about this. And here's what he says. Then the Lord paid attention, just like this sacrifice that Noah made. God smells this honor, and he, his attention whoosh, is turned toward these people who are honoring him. And it says this, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Literally, the language is here, God calls for a scroll. And here in heaven, this scroll is stretched out before God. And he says, hey, start writing their names down. Ethan's over there. What is, why does he write my name down? Because I fear him, and then literally the language is here, and they thought about him. Isn't that an interesting term? God's writing down your name when you're thinking about him. And that might seem really simple, but you know that's how honor works. If anybody's ever given you a gift and they said, I was just thinking about you, what does that do to your soul? Wow, you were just walking through a store and you thought about me. You just remembered that I, you know, I don't know, I love the Dallas Cowboys and you got me season tickets. Wow, just you were, you were, you were thinking about me, right? What, what is that? And so what's our response usually when somebody says that? Oh, how thoughtful. You see, honor flows when people just consider, think about one another. And God says, there's a book and all throughout scripture, there are only a couple of books that God has with your name in it. There's the Lamb's Book of Life, and there's this Book of Remembrance, where God says, the people that just factor me into their life, I was angry, but you know what I did? I was thinking about God. God, how can I honor you right now? I am so mad. What does honoring you in my anger look like? God, here's what I wanna do. Here's the decision I wanna make, but I'm, fa I'm thinking about you. God, what's the wise decision? You see, when people think about God, God turns his attention and it's not lost on him so much so that he says, hey, write this down. Let's not let this be lost. Everywhere God smells honor, God commands a blessing. And so here's what I want for your life. As simple as that is, here's what I want for you. In a culture of dishonor, I want you to be a family that honors God. Not because I need it, but because it's the life of God for you. There's a channel, there's a flow of the life of God when we choose honor, where his blessing can flow to you. That's what I want for us. And so today, I can't think of a better place to land this than a moment of remembrance. See, at the beginning of Malachi, God says, remember what I've done for you and your ancestors. And then at the end of Malachi, he says, don't forget I'm not done working. And at the end, he said, his, the whole book of Malachi ends with a promise that he's gonna send the Messiah. And that Messiah will one day reset all of creation and all of the evil will be gone. Literally, Malachi, the very end of it says, I'm gonna burn away everything evil one day. It's gonna be gone. And you're gonna live, and he says, in the sun of righteousness. He says, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. This is how the whole Old Testament ends. The confidence that I could have to tell you to honor God is because no matter what you think God's done in the past, it's nothing compared to what he's gonna do in the future. You can trust him. And so, for us as Christians, there's been a way from the very beginning to stop and to remember and to, to, to remember that we're a people that belong to God. And our lives are meant to be set aside and honoring him and putting him first. And that's why we observe communion. And I, I wanted to do this for a couple of reasons today. First, to give you an, a moment with God, just to consider how am I honoring him? But also just to sort of reset our taking of communion as a church. Listen, we do this because we wanna just keep at the center always of our life. I'm living out of what Jesus has done for me. What would that mean for you? How would you honor God in light of what Jesus has already done? So here's what I'd love for you to do. We're gonna take this and then we're just gonna have a moment of worship. And here's why I want us to end with a moment of worship. Um, because sometimes um, we need a, 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 an expression of how we're honoring God. 
And one of the best things for you today is to go, you know what, I'm gonna choose to honor God. Maybe you don't feel like worshiping. What a great day to do it. What a great day to say, you know what, God, I'm gonna put you first. So, for some of us, we haven't been honoring God. We've, life's been busy and we've just been going full speed and this is just a moment to recalibrate everything. Do you ever have to do that with your computer? You gotta reset it, reboot the software. This is just a moment to recalibrate and say, God, you're first. And so we're just gonna push pause. We're gonna run out of here in a few minutes, but before we do, we're just gonna push pause. We're just gonna say, God, I'm just gonna forget about everything outside this room for just a minute and I'm gonna put you first. It's why we've gathered at the beginning of the week because God gets our first and he gets our best. It's why we're gonna worship and it's why we're gonna remember that the sacrifice of Jesus is what makes it possible for us to have that relationship with him in the first place. So here's what I'd love for you to do. Would you stand? And as you do, I'd, I'd love, I'd, would you just do this? Would you just honor God enough to hold nothing but communion? Like just put your phone down, put, just put everything down for a second and just take a deep breath and just remember that Jesus is first. Now, here's what I know. For some of us, Jesus is not first. And before we take this, I wanna give you an opportunity to put him first. We hold in our hand a reminder through this bread that Jesus' body was broken so we can be healed. And a cup of juice that reminds us that Jesus' blood was shed so we can be forgiven, which means you have access to the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus right where you stand right now. And maybe today you need to start a new relationship with Jesus. You know, I'm not following him. What a great moment to start. So we're gonna pray a prayer together. And if that's you, you jump in and pray this prayer with us and the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus will meet you right where you stand. So would you say this with me? Say, dear heavenly father, thank you for Jesus. I believe he died, but rose again for me. I choose to follow you. And here's what we get to do now for many of us maybe for the first time or for a new time. We get to celebrate the, the elements of communion as a new creation in Christ. What a great gift. And so this morning, reach down and grab that piece of bread. This is a reminder that Jesus was broken so you can be whole. If there's some place in your life you need healing, what a great time to ask God for it. Maybe it's in your emotions, in your mind. There's just a brokenness in your thoughts, in your uh, own heart. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your physical body. What a great moment to believe that God heals things. And let's ask him today to be at work in making things whole. Lord Jesus, we ask you this morning, would you be the great healer, the great physician? Would you mend the things that have been torn apart by the brokenness and the pain that we walk through? Lord Jesus, would you see each of your kids turning, your, turning their hearts toward you? And would you heal as only you can? Jesus, we remember that you were broken. Literally, you gave your body to be torn apart so that we could be healed. We take the bread together. And this morning, as we hold this cup of juice, Lord, we're reminded that your forgiveness is made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus. What a gift. Lord Jesus, we can't do it on our own. We can't manufacture it by ourselves. We need you. And so this morning, Lord God, we ask you, we ask you to help the pastor open the communion. In Jesus' name, everybody. And Lord Jesus, we ask you, would you forgive? The places we've messed up, God, the places we haven't measured up, we know what they all are, and so do you. Thank you for being our savior. Thank you for your blood that provides forgiveness for us. We drink this together. And this morning with this as the backdrop, this gift of Jesus in the back of our mind, we make the decision to worship God. Not because sometimes it's easy, sometimes not because we want to, not because everybody else is, not because our world is choosing to honor God, but, be, but because for us, for this church, for our home, we will serve the Lord. And we believe that when we put him first, life grows. And so here's what I hope today. I'm praying over our church and every one of our services that God would smell honor on the people of Church on the Move. That in your home, in your life, in your relationships, God would see you turning your heart toward him, putting him first, and that he would pour out a blessing on the people of Church on the Move so that we can be a blessing to the people around us. Lord Jesus, we worship you this morning because you are good and you are worthy.